So I welcome you to the Bitcoin conference. First talk, very excited to be here, see all the exciting speakers. And our first speaker is Elise Klar, is that pronounced correctly? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah and he's going to talk on Bitcoin as a stepping stone for the Monolith Society. And I think I'll leave it to that. Um, clap your hands together for Elise Klar. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to start with a quote uh, from Richard Buckminster Fuller. We must do away with the, with the absolute specious notion that everybody has to earn a living. It is a fact today that one in 10,000 of us can make a technological breakthrough capable of supporting all the rest. The youth of today are absolutely right in recognizing the, this nonsense of earning a living. We keep inventing jobs because of this false idea that everybody has to be employed at some kind of drudgery because, according to Malthusian Darwinian theory, he must justify his right to exist. So we have inspectors of inspectors and people making instruments for inspectors to inspect inspectors. The true business of people should be go back to school and do whatever they were doing before somebody came along and told them they had to learn to earn a living. This was in the 1970s. So, what is moneyless society? A moneyless society to me is a society that supports all the basic needs to survive for humans without paying for those. Communication, education, food, and shelter. Why should we want to be in a moneyless society? Well, because it's awesome. Who doesn't want to get everything they need and to get it for free? To do whatever they want. Are we going to get there? Bitcoin. That's why we're, we, why we're all here, and um, and this um, the title of this talk is Bitcoin is a stepping stone to moneyless society. And I'm going to explain how I think we're going to reach this um, milestone in humanity of being in a society that provides all that we need without requiring work. I don't think it's going to be something that will um, change overnight. It's not that we're, we're going to wake, wake up one day and we're going to throw away our money because we don't need it anymore. But it's more of a gradual change that things will become cheaper and cheaper. And the, the amount of work that we put in creates a lot more than we used to. I'm going to start off by explaining the processes that will lead us to that, to that uh, change. First one is this dissipation of borders. Borders were once useful when resources were scarce, where creating food and finding resources was expensive, both in human labor and the resources they cost. And it was cheaper for some to invade and to steal instead of making their own and working for them. They're no longer relevant in today's time. We can see today that wars and rioting is almost non-existent. Most of the places in the world in the civilized culture, we don't have wars between people. France is not invading England. This is a new world that doesn't care about wars. We care about leisure, we care about comfort, we care about entertainment. Bitcoin will eliminate, Bitcoin already eliminates the financial borders between people around the world. I, as an, as an Israeli, I can do business with Iranian people. And if someone from North Korea wants to do business with South Koreans, they can do that. Internet and Bitcoin eliminate the financial distance. Doesn't, ma doesn't matter where you are or how far you are, Bitcoin is almost instant. It's easier to transfer money with Bitcoin than any other currency. It's simple with machines to do that. 
without needing to intervene, uh, human intervention. And the Bitcoin and the internet lower the barrier for entrance for businesses to operate. We can see in this graph that this graph indicates, uh, shows how people are riding based on the prices of food. We can see that once the price of food rises above a certain level, people start riding, people start war, doing wars, arguing with each other. While well, Bitcoin and the internet make it easier to anyone in, to connect and do business together, we're beginning to see a trend where humans are being mechanized, where humans have an API, an uh, application programming interface. But we're no longer applications, we're humans that have APIs to connect to machines, that machines tell them what to do. We already have Mechanical Turk. Amazon's um, Mechanical Turk provides people with the option to register and receive tasks from humans and machines and receive money for those tasks. Those tasks can be research related, repetitive tasks that nobody wants to do or machines can't do yet, data validation, and we'll soon begin to see uh, task delegation between various machines and humans. <coughs> 3D printing and localized manufacturing is changing the way we create things and we we make manufacturing things around the world. 450 years ago, most of the produce that we used to buy was created somewhere not far from the place we bought it. Today, most of the stuff you buy is created somewhere halfway around the world. This increases the cost of manufacturing and um, transportation for the goods. The 3D printer will be able to have faster research and development and find customized products that will be assembled according to your needs and wants. You can choose what you want, what kind of iPhone device you want, what you want inside that a device. Distributed manufacturing will enable, enable people to make pro uh, products closer to home. Lower down the, the manufacturing costs and distribution costs and eventually make most things cheaper as we progress along. Right now those printers are rather um, new, they're cumbersome, um, they're not very accurate, low resolution, but as with the digital cameras, we're going to see these printers become much, much better, much, uh, much accurate, and able to print from various materials. And this will become a very visible trend very soon in my eyes. Those are the three things. Lower barrier for entrance to businesses, faster research and development, increased interconnectedness will all basically lead to one thing. Cheaper and cheaper stuff. Whatever it is, food, gadgets, building materials, everything will become cheaper. In the 1800s, we needed almost all hands on deck to feed a city or a town with the Industrial Revolution, 
we began seeing machines taking over. We no longer need all the people in the city to actually do anything to support them. More and more people are moving away to do more interesting stuff, intellectual and entertainment. In the thousands, we are now able to feed an entire city with a handful of people that monitor and operate machines that do all the work for us. In just recent years, we began to see urban farming and mechanized farming where humans are almost not needed and where we can grow food basically everywhere. This graph shows how much work went, went in into agriculture production and the produce in the last 60 years. The red line is the amount of work that went in. It starts at the base one, and the blue line and the red line and the green line are the amount of outputs. We can see that not much work went in, not much increasing work went in. Actually, it grows a little bit and then fell back. And yet, the production of food has risen almost 250% in the last 60 years. And the purple line is the, uh, the population. We see that we not only produce a lot more with the same amount of work that we needed, to, needed 60 years ago, but we also produce more than we actually need. If we combine all the knowledge we have about the work actually being done around the world with all the time we're being the time being wasted on various stuff, we begin to see that our productivity is not optimal, to say the least. And this is not because people are lazy. In Wally -E, we've seen fat people strolling around looking at TV shows all the time, but I don't believe that's the truth. I don't like just watching TV all the time. I'm pretty sure that most of you don't like watching TV all the time. We all like doing something. All of us are doing, we have our hobbies, and productivity is basically built into us, deep, deep inside, in subatomic particles. If all the subatomic sub particles just take a minute to rest, matter would cease to exist. Nothing would exist. We would disappear. Nothing can just stop and do nothing. And we're no different. Even those of us who do work are not doing much eventually. We're being told to do things just because we need to do them. Just because, like Fuller said earlier, we need to justify our existence. But there's a lot of us who don't actually work, who don't do anything, they're unemployed, they're considered lazy or unable to work or unable to find work. By the optimistic um, counts, it's around 10%. One in every 10 of us is unemployed. By the more realistic numbers, we're talking about one in every four of us actually unemployed. We're throwing away 30% or more of our food. The Americans alone throwing away 
150 kilograms per person per year of food wasted. If we would just collect all the wasted food, we could feed 30% of the entire world, 2 billion people, just with the waste that the United States produces every day. What we'll begin to see soon is better logistics, where whatever we do, whatever we need, will be ready for us on demand. We won't go to supermarkets to buy carts full of food that maybe we'll use, maybe we won't. Supermarkets won't be stocked with food that maybe will be bought, maybe won't. Everything will be on demand. You may, we want to make breakfast tomorrow, the ingredients will be waiting at your doorstep next morning. Everything you need and want will be always ready for you. show you a video about what is uh, what drives our motivation. The United States. And let's talk about a study done at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Here's what they did. They, they, did. they took a whole group of students and they gave them a set of challenges. Things like um, memorizing strings of digits, uh, solving word puzzles, other kinds of spatial puzzles, even physical tasks like throwing a ball through a hoop. Okay, they gave them these challenges and they said to incentivize their performance, they gave them three levels of rewards. Okay? So if you did pretty well, you got a small monetary reward. If you did medium well, you got a medium monetary reward. And if you did really well, if you were one of the top performers, you got a large cash prize. Okay? We've seen this movie before. This is essentially a typical motivation scheme within organizations, right? We reward the very top performers, we ignore the low performers, and the other folks kind of in the middle, okay, get a little bit. So what happens? They do the test, they have these incentives, here's what they found out. One, as long as the task involved only mechanical skill, bonuses worked as they would be expected. The higher the pay, the better the performance. Okay, that makes sense. But here's what happens. But once the task called for even rudimentary cognitive skill, a larger reward led to poorer performance. Now this is strange, right? A larger reward led to poorer performance? How can that possibly be? Now, That's it. So in this video we saw that once we cover all our basic needs, food, shelter, we're no longer interested in monetary rewards. Once we have everything we need to survive, we have all our gadgets, we're no longer interested in getting better pay. And that study was made not once and twice, a few times, and every time it points to the same direction. Once you have already a high enough paycheck to support everything you need for your family, you no longer care about the money. So, what do we do with all the people that are unemployed today and that are going to be unemployed tomorrow because of our increased productivity that will basically make a lot more of us unemployed? We need to channel those lazy activities into something useful. For example, Civcraft is a game that uses, is basically a server that uses Minecraft as a game. Minecraft is a block building game that, it's an open world that anyone can build anything you want in it. And this Civcraft server allows players to basically do whatever they want. There are no rules except one, no cheating. And people create their various uh, governmental structures, various um, social interactions, and we can 
And we can use it, I've been, I've been following this for almost a year, and, then, and we can use it to learn about human interaction between individuals and groups. And later on, extract whatever is being built there into real world. Folded, a game that requires players to fold proteins into certain uh, structures to help actually science solve various mysteries. And the last few years it actually did help science by players that simply sit down and play this game and fold proteins in the right ways. Grand Theft Auto and Second Life to be used to create and extract material, intellectual material out of them. We just need to, to learn how how to do this. How to utilize our time that is not considered right now as productive. When we watch TV, when we, when we play video games, we're considered la lazy today. We just need to learn how to do it correctly, how to use it correctly. Soon, everything will become gamified. I'm sure most of you heard about gamification. Once we don't have social uh, monetary incentives anymore because everything is so cheap, we'll have we'll need to give people something to work for. But it's not going to be money because we have food and shelter and education, communication free. So everything is going to be with badges and points and we're all just going to compete each, uh, with each other for titles, like in sports and competitive video game. For conclusion, I'd like to start, I'd, I'd like to go back to where I started. I don't think monolith society is something that will become a thing overnight. It's, uh, it's something that we'll get to. It's something that will become part of us because everything becomes cheaper. We're, we're no longer going to be worrying about food and shelter and education, communication. And we're just going to, to do whatever we want. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we are. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Please keep your question in mind. We are going to have questions answered uh, after the third talk for all the three speakers combined. So just to save a little time and to be synchronized with the other room. Um, we are a little behind, but I think the other room has finished also. So if we start in five minutes, uh, we, we keep it synchronized so you can switch in between and you're not going to miss anything.